Welcome to Hope Church this morning. I'm grateful to be here. Anybody else grateful to be here? Yeah, it's nice to be with God's people and, and just have a sense of getting encouraged and, and being an encourager. Boy, the church needs a bunch of Barnabases, sons of encouragement. There's, if you need a ministry, become a Barnabas. Become an encourager because you got your work cut out for you. <laughs> There's plenty of work to do for those that are gifted in encouragement. And we need that encouragement today. We just sang, on the cross, Jesus sealed my pardon. He paid the debt and set me free. His blood can wash away our stain. That's encouraging. Because we have stains that need to be washed away. And he said he came to shed his blood to wash away those sins. I'm forgiven because Jesus was forsaken. I'm accepted because Jesus was condemned. Amazing love. How can it be? That's awesome. There's strength within the sorrow. There's beauty in the tears. You're with us in the fire, in the flood, and your plans are still to prosper us. And those are just encouraging words. I'm encouraged by the songs this morning. Father, we just again pray, Lord, help us to understand your word this morning. Just speak through your word. Father, we just acknowledge our need to hear from you, our knowledge to be encouraged. Fill us with your spirit that we can receive what you have for us and go out and be a Barnabas today. That we could be sons and daughters of encouragement. We love you, Lord. We thank you that we have this privilege of gathering together and speak to us as you want to. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Do you marvel at the words of Jesus? Are you stunned at what the Lord says to us? Sometimes when you read his word, you go, wow, that is amazing. What I just read there, that's like amazing. The reality of a holy God conversing with sinful man, to me it's just as stunning as his patience. God talking to man. Seriously. We, got, we saw an interesting movie last night. What was it called, Luke? An Interview with God. It's a very thought-provoking movie, but... Not only God revealing himself to us, but God himself in intervening into our lives with words to us, with expressed love to us. I personally find the intervention of God, the conversation of God to us, just as amazing as God's revelation. We need the revelation of God. But just as critical, I think, is we need the intervention of God. We need God to be revealed to us through his word, through his Holy Spirit. But don't we need God to intervene into our lives? That's what we need. Listen carefully to this quote and tell me who said this quote. You'll have to listen carefully. There'll be bonus points if you get the answer right. Inside this quote, there's a quote mentioned from Benjamin Franklin. But guess who said the full quote? Our nation was founded by men who believe in prayer. When our government was formed, Benjamin Franklin addressed the chairman of the Constitutional Convention at Philadelphia in 1787. This is what Benjamin Franklin said. I have lived, sir, a long time. And the longer I live, the more convincing proof I see of this truth that God governs in the affairs of men. If a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, it is probable that an empire cannot rise without his aid. There is but one power available to redeem the course of events, and that is the power of prayer by God-fearing, Christ-believing people. We would adapt the words of Benjamin Franklin to our day and say, it is probable that a nation cannot keep her freedom without the aid of Almighty God. The quote continues, healing is what we need. Healing is acquired when Christians again begin to pray, not with the repetition of hypocritical religious words or jargon, but with a humble heart and a clean spirit. It's time to repent and to repeat the prayer that was heard among the early Christians and that Jesus talked about in his story about the two men that went up in the temple to pray. The one that Jesus said went away justified simply prayed, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, have mercy on us. Who said that quote? That's a good guess. I'll give, I'll give you... Great, what'd you say? Yeah. That's another good guess. I'll give you one great clue. It was taken from the Decision Magazine. Oh, 
Billy Graham. That's a quote from Billy Graham. And here's another one from his son, Franklin Graham and Samaritan's Purse and the Christmas shoe boxes and all that neat stuff going on. And this was taken from Newsweek magazine. Billy Graham said, our national leaders are proposing a spending frenzy for rebuilding our nation. He said, I've flown from coast to coast. I've driven from coast to coast also. I wasn't aware that America needed rebuilding. Graham went on to argue that if America wants the country to prosper, the best thing for the government is to stay out of the way. Franklin Graham lamented further about what he views as the onset of socialism, where those in government leadership want to teach Americans to look to the government to meet their needs instead of looking to God. Graham argued that our country was built on hard work and sacrifice, and most importantly, it was built by the grace and blessing of Almighty God, urging his followers to pray that America would again seek the Lord instead of the government. That's the quote from Newsweek magazine. I love the encouragement from these two men to pray, a father and a son passing the baton to encourage a nation to pray. And you know what? We get the same encouragement from our pastors here. And I want to say this morning, I'm grateful to our pastors, and I'm glad they're both here today, and to our team of elders that support them, and to their wives. Besides encouragement to pray, I'm thankful for these three things here at Hope, and I think you should be too. At our most recent elder meeting a couple weeks ago, Pastor Joe encouraged all of us to preach the word, and not to shrink back from that. Let God speak to his people through the simple proclamation and clear preaching and diligent living out of his holy and powerful word. You really want to be a part of a fellowship like that, don't you? Where that's the top priority. I'm grateful for this emphasis. The second thing I'm grateful for is that our pastors are learning right along with us. They're mature, imperfect people, ask their wives, <laughs> striving to be an example of living for Jesus to those in this flock. I've heard both pastors say something to this effect. I used to feel this way about a particular teaching or doctrine, but the more I study God's word and the bigger picture I get of the Lord, I now feel a little more this way than I used to. And that's powerful, is it not? Because pastors and elders are kind of like playing coaches. Their job is to equip the other parts of the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry spread the gospel, but they're right out here in the field with us. Not just coaching, but they're participating, growing, and learning right along with us. And I'm thankful for that. The third thing I'm grateful for about this church is that the different members here that make up the body of Christ here are consistently encouraged to become Bible hearers, Bible readers, Bible studiers, and Bible doers for themselves. Aren't you? It's about personal application. How can I live for God? And what does he ask me about? <clears throat> Take what you hear at Hope Church, and the pastors would encourage you this as well, and examine it in light of Scripture. Make sure what is taught here accurately reflects and represents the heart and the Word of God. Luke recorded in his second letter to Theophilus, we call it the book of Acts. His first letter we call the Gospel of Luke. But in his second letter, book of Acts 1711, Luke says this about a certain church, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away by night to the Bereans. When Paul and Silas arrived, they went to the Berean synagogue. The Bereans were noble and more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received God's word with all readiness, and they searched the scriptures daily to find out whether the things that Paul and Silas were teaching were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks and prominent women as well as men. Let's continue to be known, as I believe we are known, as people who search the scriptures and become doers of the word from the encouragement of our pastors. I'm grateful. So again, I'm thankful for pastors and elders who preach the word, live out the word, and equip the saints to do so as well. Thank you, Lord. Most of us plainly see that we are living in a country that is increasingly mandating things from its citizens that some citizens don't want to do. Our feel before God, they simply can't do. But you know, this type of situation is not new to God's people. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, we can read about dominant government leaders mandating things that God's people knew were just wrong. There's even a variety of Christians, if we're honest with ourselves, and a variety of viewpoints here at Hope, and that's okay. It's actually a healthy thing. And there is at the church at large. 
But there's been a wide variety of, of Christians ever since the church started. In a few pages of the New Testament, we can read about differences between the early believers. Things that they didn't divide over, but things they felt differently about. You can look at Romans 14. There's a couple issues there about eating certain foods and observing certain feast days or holidays. Some of the believers ate certain foods and others could not be talked into it. Some of the believers celebrated certain days, but some couldn't in good conscience celebrate those days. And in Romans 14, the last two verses, Paul concludes with this. That's what it says. So whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the man who does not condemn himself by what he approves. But the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats, because his eating is not from faith. Everything that does not come from faith is sin. That's the last two verses of Romans 14. There was liberty given in the scriptures to work out these things in the confines of your individual walk with God, between you and God, with the only subjective requirement being to do what you do as a result of your faith in God, wasn't it? That's what it just said. And this applies for us today, right here in Hope Church. You see, some wear a mask, and here in Hope Church, they're not made to feel bad about wearing a mask. It's their choice. But some can't wear a mask here at Hope Church, and they're not made to feel bad about not wearing a mask. So whether you wear a mask or you don't wear a mask, step in faith and do all for the glory of God, and do it without making division. And I don't think that's an issue here. Some here are vaccinated, but they're not to make feel bad because they've received the vaccine. Some here are uninterested or unable to take the vaccine. And they're not made to feel bad because they did not receive the vaccine. So whether you get the vaccine or don't get the vaccine, step in faith and do all for God's glory. And don't make that a dividing issue in the church. And I think we do well in that, in all honesty. We're here free to talk. There's freedom to share words about why you wear a mask. There's freedom to share words about maybe why you don't have a piece about getting the vaccine. But we're really not free, according to Scripture, to divide over it or to restrict conversations about it. We can talk about it. But let's not divide over personal health decisions, and let's not divide over whether or not we can talk about these things. That's not right to do so. There's likely coming down the line a whole lot bigger issues that we should also be able to vigorously discuss and debate but not divide over. Causing division in the church over such things is hurtful and unproductive. Let God be God. <clears throat> Considering the reality of face mask mandates that we're seeing around the world, potential vaccine mandates, and increasingly we're beginning to see mandates against even expressing, <laughs> using words, and verbalizing personal opinions or beliefs about any number of topics. Are we not? We're seeing people get backlash, even our own nation, because of simply talking, using words, asking simple questions about a wide range of topics like abortion or biblical marriage or God-honoring sexuality or vaccines or even 5G cell phone towers. <laughs> My daughter is on uh, the city council at Rollin, they're not even allowed to ask certain questions about 5G cell phone towers, which is interesting. Uh, some of the other topics are like ivermectin, <laughs> face mask, and believe it or not, you can get in trouble for even mentioning hydroxychloroquine. I don't know if I got it spelled right. I probably don't. All these topics and even more actually polarize people in the different camp, camps, and we see people being so-called canceled if they have a different perspective that what seems to be like the majority media-driven perspective, which quite frankly can be amazingly fickle over the course of time. But what can we do about it? And what should we do about it? And more application-wise, what are we going to do about it? You know, you can look at Mark 12, 17. I'll read it here. Very simple verse. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God, the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. 
what it said. There you have it. People marveling at the words of Jesus after he spoke his words. He simply said, render the Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at his words. Normally, the, the default position of many Christians is to obey the government that God has established over us. I mean, they say drive 70, and most of us drive 70, right? <laughs> they say pay your taxes, and you better be paying your taxes. Although we will come visit you in prison if you don't. After all, isn't that what Jesus is telling us when he says, render the Caesars, the things that are Caesars? And we learn in Romans 14 that God has legitimized human government, even the imperfect ones, for the punishment of evildoers. God is clearly stating in his word in Romans 13 that he has ordained our government to punish evildoers. Therefore, Christians are indeed to respect and obey that government that God has placed over them and is ordained by God. But what if... And I kind of like what ifs. Usually the questions from my son through the years always came with, hey, Pop, what if? And then it was always interesting to see what the what if was going to be. But what if the government, instead of punishing evildoers, what if they became the driving force behind doing the evil? And the very evil they're doing is the very evil they should be punishing. What if? Are there times when Christians should disobey their government and obey God instead of obeying government? There is a pattern for this type of civil disobedience. I prefer to call it godly disobedience. In the Bible, and I mentioned these things a couple of months ago at a message here at Hope Church titled Godly Disobedience. Hebrew midwives disobeying the government, allowing their babies to live when they were mandated by the government to kill the baby boys. They didn't obey the government. Why? Moses' parents, they actually hid their little baby boy, Moses, from their government. They didn't hand it over to be killed as they were mandated to do. They didn't obey their government. Why? Ray, Rahab didn't squeal. I think Josiah mentioned this last week. Rahab didn't squeal to the government as they mandated, and she chose to hide the Jewish spies instead. Remember that? She was mandated to turn them guys in, but she didn't obey the government. Why? Daniel refused to eat the king's meat, and he continued to openly pray to God, even when the government mandated it as illegal. He didn't obey the government. Why? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to a statue of Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, like worship of the government. <laughs> that was like to a T. They were given a man mandate from the government to do so with severe punishment for non-compliance, and they chose not to do it. Why? The wise men disobeying the government leader. They didn't go back to him as they were commanded to do so after they saw the newborn King Jesus. Why was that? And Joseph and Mary, they fled to Egypt to escape Herod's mandate to slaughter all the baby boys in Bethlehem. They didn't go along with the mandate. They disobeyed. Why? And Paul and several early church leaders, it's recorded, were jailed numerous times and tortured numerous times because they preached Jesus as Lord instead of Caesar being Lord. I mean, Caesar wanted to be Lord. And they were preaching, no, Jesus is Lord. And they continued to preach Jesus everywhere in violation of Rome's mandated laws. They didn't obey the government. <coughs> Why is that? There are several other instances of appropriate godly disobedience being mentioned where they didn't obey the government leaders, and why. And often we read about God's deliverance for his people, even these stories that we just talked about, in these type of situations, God delivers them miraculously. Jesus shows up in the furnace, uh, lots, of de lots of deliverances, but that's not always the case. Many times, through history and even in the Bible, God's people suffered ter terribly in being faithful to him and finally dying as a result of doing the right thing. We can read about it in Hebrews 11. I'll read it here. 
What shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. These people through faith subdued kingdoms. They worked righteousness. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the violent fires. They escaped the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, they were made strong in the Lord. They became valiant in battle. They turned to flight the armies of other nations, women receiving their dead back to life. Many saw incredible deliverances. However, also in Hebrews 11, many others, just as faithful, were tortured, not experiencing deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. These others had trials of being mocked, and scourged, and yes, many were put in chains and imprisoned. It says they were stoned, some were sawn in two, others were sorely tempted, and even others were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They were forced to wander in deserts, in mountains, in dens, in caves, because they chose to be faithful to God. It's amazing, isn't it? In other words, there's often a price to pay for the people of God to do the right thing. And it's okay to talk about that in the forefront of having to make those decisions. Deliverance from suffering is not guaranteed on this earth. We can read about in the scriptures. But God's faithfulness to you in that moment is the guarantee. God will be faithful. He can deliver if he wants to. But if he chooses not to, the people of God just obey God anyway. And might get to go be, get to go be with him. I mean, I, I wasn't going to mention this, but sometimes I think about those three young boys. You know, they said, if our God's delivered, if our God's able to deliver, and he can do it. But if he doesn't, he doesn't. Well, they go into the fire, and there's Jesus. Jesus shows up. I mean, they're looking forward to going to heaven. They're pretty sure they're going to go to heaven. And Jesus shows up like, man, <laughs> we don't get to go to heaven yet? <laughs> It'd be interesting to hear that conversation. We still got, we still got a few more miles to run in this journey. They, they figured it out. Are you willing to do the right thing? Really is the point here, isn't it? Even to suffer for it. Even potentially to pay the ultimate price of death for pursuing righteousness Living right in the eyes of God instead of going along things that you know with things that you know are wrong. That's the question. Are you willing to do the right thing even to suffer for it, perhaps even to pay the ultimate price of death for pursuing righteousness, which is right living in the eyes of God, instead of going along with things that you know are wrong? Back to Jesus' marvelous statement in Mark twelve seventeen: Give to God the things that are God's. Doesn't that place God above all human government? Doesn't it teach us that we must give God our lives and give our, our lives for his kingdom? We are made in the image of God. Shouldn't we say with the apostles we ought to obey God rather than men? So when is civil or godly disobedience called for in the Christian life? I mean, really. When is it called for to disobey the government and here what I think is the answer whenever a government or anybody else compels or mandates you to sin or prevents you to do something that is required by God then God wants you to disobey that in the most God honoring way possible again whenever a government or anybody else compels or mandates you to sin or prevents you from doing something that is required by God, then God wants you to disobey that with a clear conscience in the most God-honoring way possible. We're to obey God rather than man in those situations. The government can, by the way, the government can allow sin, which it does, without compelling <coughs> us to sin. An example, the government in our nation allows some pretty horrendous things. 
let's just say fornication and drunkenness. It's put up with, isn't it? Nobody gets thrown in jail for those things. But it doesn't require or compel us to participate in fornication or drunkenness, does it? There's a distinction there. What we must learn to wrestle with as individuals is when does the government cross the line from allowing sin to compelling us to sin or even mandating us to sin? When has the government crossed the line to outlawing what God clearly requires? One such area we must wrestle with and talked about commonly around here because we're supporters of the Pregnancy Resource Center is, is abortion. The government allows abortion, doesn't it? It's going on. But currently in our nation, the government doesn't compel abortion. It can't force a young lady to do that. It does in other nations, but not in this nation. That's true, but there's something a little more to consider here than just that obvious thing. Nobody's mandated to do an abortion or to have an abortion. But the Bible does compel us to rescue those who are being led away to death. To hold back those who are staggering toward, staggering toward the slaughter. Aren't there many implications for us as it relates to the laws of the land allowing abortion and whether or not we will obey or support those laws? There is. Historically, we could also think of the slave trade, which led many innocent lives to be ruined and sometimes slaughtered. No one was mandated in this country to own slaves, were they? There were no laws to require you to have a slave, but it was allowed by the government, slavery. But should we not even fight against laws that enslave another person unjustly? And there was believers that did that quite a bit, were there not? They fought against the laws that allowed for slavery because that was wrong. Even though it wasn't mandated, they had to own slaves. In our present society, we might think of abortion, which leads many 1.5 million children to their death every year are murdered because of abortion. Should we not oppose those laws? Should we not, when given opportunity, even godly disobey those laws in the name of the love of those that are being slaughtered? However, that might be. Abortion is one of those issues. There are many others on the horizon, and some of you guys can see those coming up. I believe there's a day coming when we may no longer be able to preach the gospel without serious consequences. Or gather and worship because of our beliefs. Or maybe because we're not vaccinated. Or maybe because we don't affirm perverted marriage. And this day is no longer apparently out there somewhere. It seems like it's becoming closer and closer to reality, doesn't it? especially in other nations, but I think it's coming here too. But what will we do? Will we still preach what God has said? Will we still gather? Will we have the courage to obey God rather than man? Some of the high points of this whole discussion that we've already mentioned, but the government of every nation is ordained by God. That's what the scripture says, to punish evildoers. It is there because God has allowed it to be there for the punishment of evildoers, but God is our ultimate authority. We do not obey, Christians do not obey evil laws. As Christians, we should expect opposition and understand that we're living in exile here, no matter what country you live in. We're called pilgrims and strangers. Now, this isn't really our home. This is all temporary. The default position of the Christian is to live in obedience to the government that God has ordained, to live quiet and peaceful lives, to work with their hands, Paul wrote to Timothy, and not stir up the government against us. But we still do not follow evil laws. We, and we do not shrink back from speaking truth and sharing the gospel. Christians are free, as God leads them, to stand up to protest against every law that allows sin. It's okay. We can speak against abortion laws that allow abortion. We're free to say that law is a bad law. We're not going to go along with it. We might even stand here on a sidewalk and hold a sign to keep people from going in, even if standing on the sidewalk is against the law. We want to prevent babies from being murdered. So if Christians are free to do that or not to do that, 
But Christians must aggressively oppose and wrestle with laws that compel people to sin. There comes a point to where you need to get further involved. The distinction is significant. Again, Christians are free to stand in protest against laws that allow sin, but Christians must oppose laws that compel people to sin. You see the difference? There is a difference. Christians are called to godly disobedience when it is a loving thing to do. That includes primarily rescuing those who need to be rescued. Proclaiming the gospel must be done regardless of the laws of the land. Fighting against injustices that lead to death of the innocent is required of Christians. Somebody needs to stand up and protect people that are made in the image of God, which is every person. Whenever possible, Christians should use the system of justice that is in place to bring change that will prevent or correct the injustice. Unfortunately, our justice system is quickly changing into an injustice system. But still, we must do what we can to use the legal system to fight the legal system or to use the justice system to fight the injustices going on around us. As the Lord leads, Christians should practice nonviolent, godly disobedience when the situation calls for it. This was modeled by our Savior. It was modeled by the apostles. It was modeled by thousands of people down through history. They preached the gospel. They shared the truth even when it was against the law. They didn't rise up in violence against the rulers. They trusted God for protection. They lived in faith, and they pursued doing the right thing. And they willingly suffered the consequences for it. They faithfully did what God the Father wanted them to do. In fact, Jesus said in John 6, 38, this is the words of Jesus that I marvel at. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Are you committed to do the will of our Father in heaven as Jesus did? My encouragement in all of this short message today is for all of us to give to God the things that belong to God. Give God his things. You were made in the image of God to bring him honor by the way you live your life. You were purchased by the blood of Jesus. We sang about it today. You can be empowered by the Holy Spirit to bring the truth to those that you cross paths with. So three quick encouragements. Draw close to God in prayer. Read and study his words. Let God's word marvel you. And thirdly, repent from the sins that are holding you back. Be filled with the spirit, empowered and directed by God. Don't let those three things become cliche. Listen to them again. Draw close to God in prayer. Read and study his word on your own. And marvel at his words. And thirdly, repent from the sins holding you back, being filled with his spirit, empowered and directed by God. That's the response, isn't it? That's the response of God's people, to live as we ought to live. Pray asking God, read, study his word, repent and be filled with the spirit. Render to God, give to God the things that belong to God. This primarily means you. You give to God your body, your life, even your possessions. Don't shrink back, even in the face of extreme pressure, not to give God the things that belong to God. Listen to Paul begging the Romans here. I beseech you, I beg you, I urge you, I implore you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world. The pressure to conform, not just on the young people, but all of us is increasing. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Isn't that what repentance is? Thinking differently? Have your mind renewed by the scriptures? Be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So you'll know how to make decisions that are decisions that God wants you to make. Paul is begging us to present our bodies to him, our lives to him, that we could know the will of God and walk in it. 
but we're going to close by going back to prayer. Because we have a lot of things to pray for in our nation. But there's a lot of things to pray for in the world. I'm going to bring one of them up that just got published yesterday. This, the title of this is 14,000, over 14,000, Prayer Pledges Delivered to the Politician Who's on Trial for Being a Christian. This is in Finland. And by the way, Finland actually says it's a Christian nation. But so does America, doesn't it? Words are cheap, aren't they? The Family Research Council, which is based in America, has had a special advisor of religious freedom, Andrew Brunson, who works for Family Research Tower. He delivered to a lady called Maria Rasanen in Finland 14,341 prayer pledges. People wanted to know, Maria, that they were praying for her. They are promises from individuals across the nation to pray for her as she's being persecuted and attacked in Finland for sharing the truth of Scripture regarding God's design for marriage and sexuality. She also happens to be a member of parliament in Finland. She's a government leader. And her church leader, Bishop Pohala, are on trial in Finland, essentially for being Christians and for speaking truth from Scripture. The nation, Finland has determined that it's hate to follow Bible teachings on marriage and sexuality. It's a hate crime to tell people the definition of biblical marriage and God's design for sexuality. The Family Research Council, uh, Brunson, he himself was actually spent two years in prison in, in Turkey for the same reasons. Anyway, Maria's trial is actually going on right now in Finland. This uh, woman politician who's also a, a Christian, her trial is, is going on as we speak and a verdict is expected to be announced within the coming weeks. The Family Research Council says, I admire Maria's courage and faith. There is a way to escape the pressure that she's under. She could compromise. She could apologize for her beliefs, but she's standing firm. I think that many in the West, and the West to people in Finland is actually the Americas, because we're west of them. North and South America, Canada, we're like everybody's the West. Uh, Family Research Council said many in the West are going to face similar choices as the culture becomes increasingly hostile to faithful followers of Jesus. Maria has given a powerful example of uncompromising allegiance to God's word for us to follow, and I honor her for doing this. This is what Maria said. All this case is intended to suppress Christianity and to criminalize the Bible with ramifications for the entire West and really for the entire world. The prosecution has, unbeknownst to them, has created opportunities to proclaim Christian theology all over the world. So now we get to read about what the case is and we get to read about what biblical marriage is and we get to read about God's design for sexuality because they're making a big stink about it. And so she's looking at it as an opportunity to bring truth to places that she never were before. And wasn't that how it was with Paul? going before Felix and going for Nero and going for, it was intended to prosecute and persecute and God was expanding his kingdom. She's viewing this as the same way. She told the publication, I, I was happy for the possibility to tell the gospel, the solution to the problem of sin in front of the courts, in front of the media, and in front of the world. It's awesome, isn't it? What a great attitude. Maria and her bishop are being prosecuted for stating basic Christian beliefs about sex and marriage. One of the three charges against her is for tweeting a picture of a Bible verse. She just took a picture of a Bible verse. I tweet. I, I send those out to you. Is there anybody else? I'm always getting like little pictures on my text message with Bible verses on it. And she sent one out. Uh, and the Finland state, uh, Finland was, felt criticized about his co-sponsorship of a homosexual parade. She sent out a verse clarifying the truth about that, and she's getting in trouble for it. If convicted, Maria and her bishop will face fines and up to two years in prison. Uh, one U.S. representative from Texas said, over the past three years, Maria and her bishop have handled their persecution with bravery, grace, and mercy. 
All Christians ought to stand together in defense of biblical truth and against the attacks of this fallen world. Because if these people succeed in Finland, it won't be long before they try it everywhere else, including here in America. And I would say it probably is already tempted, being tempted here, is it not? Uh, he also says, I would characterize the day as a modern inquisition or heresy trial. He said the new sexual orthodoxy lends itself to legal harassments of Christians, even in the United States, where florists, photographers, and bakers have been run out of business because they failed to promote the ideology of LGBT agenda. It's here, isn't it? Marie explained that the priest, police interrogated her for hours for her Christian faith, and she told them she refused to recant from her Christianity. That's awesome. That's awesome. And she reminded them that it's not a crime in Finland to be a Christian because supposedly Finland's a Christian nation. She said the police threatened her over decision and that she should leave these te teachings. Remember to pray for her and to pray for our nation about these things. And so we're going to do that today. I never met Maria, but we're going to pray for her and for us. I was going to ask Braden and Jaron, can you guys help me here? I got one for every household, and there may be more. If there is, take two. But you guys want to give every person or household here at least one of these make sure you get one in your home I'm going to just wait a second where everybody gets a copy of that I just copied off the article about Maria and about her situation Make sure the folks down out there in the psalm booth get one too, Jaren. Okay, we're just going to go to prayer, and then we'll probably close with a song after this. But uh, we're going to pray for Maria and for her bishop and for Finland and for the court case that's going on right now and for God's will to be done. And I acknowledge I don't know what God's will is in this. His allowable will. Tr I know God's will is always for the truth to come out and always for God's people to be empowered, to be faithful Christians. So we'll pray along that way. But let's pray together. Father, we as a church want to lift up the situation in Finland to you. We pray for Maria and her bishop and the lawyers and the courts and the judges and everything about this, Lord. We pray that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. <laughs> We pray that you would empower your people as you obviously are already doing to speak the truth in love and to godly disobey under the power of your spirit when it's called for. And help us in our nation, Lord, to, to be people who shine light in the dark places and give hope to the hopeless and to live lives that give people an opportunity to see that you are alive and real and they could be free too from their sin. We want to be proclaimers of your gospel. We're praying that for our nation and for Finland and the nations of the world, Lord. Thank you that we have the privilege of talking to you and you talking to us. And Lord, we do marvel at that. And Lord, even as we close in prayer here, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this church. We thank you for this community, our country. And we thank you for the world, Lord, that you so loved the world that you sent your son to free and forgive. We're going to sing this song again that we sang. It was the last, it was the last song we sang uh, earlier. Just as a reminder that God has a plan even in suffering.
there is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our morning. the love that cast out fears you are working in our waiting you're sanctifying us and beyond our understanding Teaching us to trust Your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood You're faithful forever You're perfect in love Yeah, you are sovereign over wisdom unimagined who could understand your ways reigning high above the heavens reaching down in endless grace you're the lifter of the lowly and kind You surround and you uphold me Yeah And your promises are my delight Your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You are with us in the fire and the flood perfect in love yeah you are sovereign over us and even what the enemy means for evil you turn it for our good you turn it for our and for your glory and even in the valley you are faithful you're working for our good you're working for our good and for your glory and even what the enemy means for evil you turn it for our good you turn it for our good and for still to prosper you have not forgotten us you are with us in the fire and the flood us together you're faithful forever you're faithful forever yeah you're perfect in love yeah you are sovereign over us your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us you are with us in the fire and the 